With electricity costs absolutely skyrocketing in the last couple of years, starting a home lab server can seem like a bit of an immediate non-starter with how power hungry those giant servers are. But what if I told you that this little device here was capable of running pretty much everything you need for a really great little home lab setup, all while literally fitting in the palm of my hand. Sounds almost too good to be true, right? This is the brand new R2 from iCool Core, a new upgraded version of the R1 Pro that we took a look at a few months back, but with one or two big upgrades to make it a super small but super powerful home lab server. Now, if you have seen the R1 Pro, then the R2, aside from some really subtle differences, is going to look pretty much identical. The entire chassis is made up of the same CNC aluminium design as the R1, which along with helping with thermals and rigidity, I personally think looks fantastic. At the front, we have two USB-A 3.1 Gen 2 ports, along with the power button, same as before, and then on the left hand side we find four 2.5 gigabit network ports, three of which are Intel based NICs and one which is Realtek based which is a slight change over the previous model which were all Intel. Alongside those is a HDMI 2.0 port supporting up to 4K60 and a USB-C port for power. Finally on the other more left hand side there is another change where the SD card slot from the R1 has now been replaced with a second USB-C port for audio. I guess not many people were using the SD card but I think I'd personally prefer the SD card to an audio only USB-C port for me personally, but just a subtle change. Taking off the top cover we have easy access to the M.2 slot which you can configure with up to a 1TB SSD directly from iCool Core themselves or bigger if you want to add your own. And tearing down the unit further, we get our first glimpse at what is the biggest upgrade in this little powerhouse, which is the brand new CPU, an i3 N300, which doubles the amount of cores over the previous model with eight, and turbos harder all the way up to 3.8 gigahertz, whilst using a bit less power than the older Pentium. These extra cores are really gonna come in handy when running more VMs or apps in our home lab, Though unfortunately, it's still limited to 16 gigabytes of RAM, same as before. Pricing depends on the configuration, but the new R2 starts at a lower price than the R1, which is nice to see, which gets you a four core chip and eight gigabytes of RAM for 259 with some storage. However, if you want to use this for a home lab server, which we are going to get into in just a second, I would definitely recommend the eight core version and 16 gigabytes which comes in at 399. The thing I was really looking forward to testing with the R2 though, was a simple question. Can you fit everything you would need for an essentials only home lab setup, and I mean everything, on this one tiny server? Does it have the power to run all of the basics and run all of those basics well? Well, firstly, what are the basics? This will differ from person to person, but for me, this would be five main things a host, somewhere we can run our VMs, apps and services, a firewall or router for internet, DNS, security and VPN, a media server for streaming movies around the house to different devices, some Dropbox style storage for accessing files on any device, and because this is a smart home channel, we of course need a home automation server. Now the keen-eyed among you here will notice that there is one component missing, which is a NAS somewhere to safely store and back up all of our important data, which would normally make up my sixth pillar of an essential home lab server. But given the tiny footprint of the R2 and that it only takes a single M.2 SSD, we just can't do that here in any real capacity and with any real redundancy. So we're gonna have to call it the essentials almost home lab server. Now that seemed like quite a lot of stuff to load up on this one tiny device but let me show you how I did just that. Starting with the host, which is the base of any home lab server, I selected Proxmox as our hypervisor of choice for its versatility and low footprint. Proxmox is a really great free open source hypervisor based on Debian, which is what allows us to take this one piece of hardware and run multiple apps, containers, and even OSs by using virtual machines. And what's really cool about Proxmox and most hypervisors in general 
is that you can even take physical devices attached to the host and pass that hardware directly into VMs and containers as if it was just attached to them, which comes in real handy for making best use of these four network ports, which I immediately did when I fired up the first virtual machine for our home lab, which was OpenSense for our router and firewall. OpenSense installed as normally on here, just as a straight VM onto Proxmox, with the only additional step I did was to pass through two of our network ports through to the OpenSense VM. For a firewall or router, you're going to want at least a minimum of two network ports, one for the internet link or WAN, and one for the local network or LAN. Now, since we have four network ports here, there is a few different ways that we could approach this. And the way I've went for here is to assign two to our firewall for the WAN and LAN, one left to the host for the management network, and the final one I will assign to be used by the VMs and containers so that they've all got their own NIC. You may want to do something different though, like assign three interfaces to OpenSense if you want to maybe get fancy with some additional VLANs and just use one interface to handle management and VM traffic. I also configured OpenSense with two CPUs, which should be enough for my one gig internet link and gave two gigs of RAM also, which should be enough. Other than that, OpenSense was just configured as normal. I set up my interfaces, set up DHCP scopes, DNS, firewall rules, and all of the usual stuff. And then I moved on to setting up the next VM in our home lab setup, which was Home Assistant, of course, for our home automation server. Nothing exciting to see here and something you've probably seen here dozens of times by now. I gave this VM a single core for Home Assistant along with three gigs of RAM, which will suffice for now. And with both of these running, we are hovering right around the four and a half gigs of memory used along with 2% CPU utilization for the entire system. Pretty great so far. My next task was to install Nextcloud, which is going to handle our Dropbox style storage and allow us to sync files around on all of our devices automatically. And it also gives you access to Nextcloud Hub, which is their collaboration features with Office functionality, and of course, all running locally on your hardware. For this, I was going to create a dedicated Docker VM to run some other apps, but I noticed that there is already a Nextcloud template already built into Proxmox containers, which uses LXC. This means it was like literally a couple of clicks to install Nextcloud on Proxmox and have it configured and working in under five minutes. and means we are getting the benefit of containers in this instance without needing another VMs just to host our Docker apps. The Nextcloud container only needs one single core and one gigabyte of memory as it's really low usage. And this is reflected in our resources, which have barely moved by having Nextcloud running. These will probably increase a little bit when things are syncing and more people are using it, but we are in really great shape here. That is until we come to the one that I was most worried about, which is our media server. See, playing back media isn't that taxing when playing back on a modern desktop, for example, which can natively play back most file formats. The real challenge, however, comes when you try to play back a file on a device like a TV that doesn't natively support the format or the codecs and the server has to convert that file on the fly as it's streaming to a format that the TV does understand, a process that is called transcoding. And if you have to transcode for multiple devices, all playing back different things at the same time, this can be a really challenging situation and will be a good test of the new CPU performance on the R2. For my media server, I went with Jellyfin for this install over Plex, the reasons for which you can find in my recent What's in My Home Lab video. Jellyfin is an open source media server that, unlike Plex, actually respects your privacy and just gets on with doing the thing that it's designed for, streaming your media. After loading up the Jellyfin container on Proxmox, I prepared for the worst and just assigned half of our resources to Jellyfin, giving it eight gigabytes of RAM and four CPUs, to give it the best possible chance of managing to transcode anything. I also made sure to enable quick sync on our CPU and pass that through to the Jellyfin container as that will massively help since quick sync is a hardware encoder and decoder specifically designed to speed up this process. And Jellyfin can massively take advantage of quick sync. 
It's a little tricky to pass through to the container, but once you get it working, it should make a huge difference. But let's find out. After copying over some test content and getting my media library set up, all that was left to do was fire up some content on my phone, cross my fingers and pray for the best. And to my surprise, playing back a 4K file with HEVC transcoding to H.264, the R2 handles it like an absolute champ. I was seeing around 9-10% of CPU usage on the container, with just 6-7% to total CPU on the server itself, with everything else running. That's amazing. Obviously this will depend on your content, the bitrate, codecs, etc, but this is a really positive result. But surely we couldn't play back and transcode another stream at the same time, could we? To my surprise, I was blown away to find out that loading up 5 4K movies all playing back and transcoding at the same time was handled with ease and gave us a CPU usage of 15-16% to for the Jellyfin container or 11-12% to for the entire system, while OpenSense is running, while Nextcloud is running and while Home Assistant is running. I was genuinely very surprised at how well it handled this and the even more impressive thing is that not only that, but it seems to have plenty of capacity to spare too since we are running much less than a quarter of the total CPU power and only 30% of our total memory. Now granted I would plan to have a bit more headroom for a proper production environment where there is heavier traffic from multiple users all going through the firewall, syncing to Nextcloud and so on, but this thing has a ton of potential and could be expanded even more to run more home lab servers in the future. One last thing to cover though that certainly goes hand in hand with these small farm factor PCs and something that I mentioned in the beginning and that is power consumption. So at idle, which I'm going to classify as having Proxmox up and running with all four of our services up and running, so Nextcloud, Home Assistant, OpenSense and Jellyfin were all running but no streaming was happening, that is what I'm classifying as idle and I was sitting right around 13 to 14 watts at idle which is pretty good considering this is a full x86 processor. And then when I fired up all five streams and started doing transcoding from Jellyfin on top of that, it was hovering right around 29 watts pretty much the entire time. Not bad at all. The top cover on the R2 does get pretty warm at times if you really hit it hard, to the point where it's almost uncomfortable to keep your hand on top, but the underside is much cooler and I guess that's just the case doing its job properly and acting like a heatsink to dissipate all of that heat. The brand new R2 then packs an incredible punch for its tiny form factor, the only thing that's really missing being space for extra storage. But given how much they've crammed in here to this rather impressive footprint, it's probably not a huge deal for most people given that you can chuck in a 2TB SSD in here and load up quite a lot of things and then you could use something else for a NAS that you can store media on. I honestly really love this little thing, I love to see what's possible now with regards to tiny computers and just cramming as many features as possible into the smallest form factor possible. Super cool little device and would certainly recommend it if you're looking to diving into hosting some of your own home lab services for local and privacy sakes but you don't want to spend a ton of money and you want to just come get something that's really compact and that really uses very little power whilst being very, very capable. If you're interested in the R2, I will of course have it linked down in the description and please drop me a comment while you're down there to let me know your thoughts. It does really help me out. I love interacting with you guys. I really hope you enjoyed this review, tried to do something a little bit different and showed the kind of things that you could run on this to get to give a bit more of a practical example so I do hope it was useful. Let me know down in the comments also if you want to know more about some of the services and maybe we'll do guides on some of the services too if there's, uh, if there's something you would like to see drop that down below um, and we can, we can take a look at how to do that on the R2. Please make sure to drop this video a like and get subscribed if you haven't already and I will see you in the next video.